I'm going to um, talk uh, about, um, well, e you know, Evan said, talk about China and North Korea. And so I'm going to try to do that. But I'm going to try to do it from um, a perspective that I'm not used to, which is trying to talk about it from what a Korea specialist thinks about China's policy towards North Korea. Right, so it's not a China specialist, but from the perspective as a Korea specialist, their policy towards, uh, towards North Korea. And <clears throat> for me, um, there has always been a, um, a basic puzzle in China's behavior towards North, North Korea. And this, it's a question that I often get from uh, uh, policymakers. I get it from my neighbors. Uh, I get it from um, um, uh, talk show hosts. You know, you, they, they, they really don't understand. They want to know, why does China stick with North Korea? Um, by stick with North Korea, I mean defined as not abrogating its ties or severe, severely curtailing their ties uh, with North Korea, despite the fact that China suffers dearly from, uh, from this relationship. Right? It seems like pretty puzzling behavior. China suffers dearly in the sense that um, North Korea's future is uncertain, and I'll talk about that um, in a minute. Um, and yet it's, it has been a perpetual black hole for Chinese assistance for decades. Um, Ch China suffers dearly in the sense that um, its desire to rise peacefully in today's international system is in no way helped by North Korea. Every time the North Koreans undertake some sort of belligerent action, uh, China's, as my friend Tom Christensen, our friend Tom Christensen likes to say, to, um, China's name gets, good name gets dragged through the mud because everybody then blames China for bad North Korean behavior. Um, and China suffers dearly in the sense that uh, North Korea's con continued pursuit of nuclear weapons, ballistic missiles, cyber, you know, every asymmetric capability you can imagine has prompted reactions from countries in the region, whether this is the heightened tempo of military exercising uh, by the US and its allies in the region, whether it's Abe's pursuit of um, collective self-defense, uh, whether it's South Korea's consideration of closer missile defense ties with the United States and Japan, whatever it is, the North's actions only appear to undercut China's strategic position in the region. So the question is, why doesn't China just cut them off? Why don't they just cut them off? Um, and so I think there are many potential answers to this question, um, but I'm going to offer um, uh, just three. Right? And you can think of them as explanations. You can think of them as, you know, I see a lot of students' theories, if you want, um, about what drives uh, China's behavior towards DPRK. Um, no one of these is correct, right? Um, and many of them are interlinked. Um, moreover, as we look at China's behavior towards DPRK, we always have to remember that this behavior does not operate in a vacuum for Beijing. Uh, policy choices, or in particular, adjusting policy, also has, always has to be weighed against other domestic and foreign policy priorities. So there are all sorts of possible explanations for why China doesn't cut them off. And let me just offer three. Um, and in the um, discussion, uh, I invite you to offer others. Uh, as well. Um, and I choose these three not because they are my favorites, but because I think they best highlight, at least from my perspective, um, the dilemmas of Chinese foreign policy towards DPRK. Um, the primary goal, I think, of China's policy towards the peninsula is to maintain stability, right? That is sort of the straightforward goal. But it seems to me there exists some really profound ironies in each of China's strategies that I'm going to talk about that I presume the Chinese understand and they know about, uh, but for whatever reason have been unable to address. Okay. Um, so the first explanation uh, focuses on reform. Right? Um, so why does China not abandon North Korea? It has to do with reform, right? And the basic argument here is that cutting off the North would create chaos and instability 
And instead, a much better strategy is to stand by the regime, to aid it, to try to promote it, and in the long term, with the hope of creating some sort of economic reform in the country. Right? And I'll explain this table in a minute, but um, um, just, I mean, I'll always remember, as, as, as Evan said, I was a part of the US delegation for the six party talks. And so we spent quite a bit of time in Beijing um, in these negotiations. And when I first went to six party talks as one of our negotiators, I had just uh, come out of the university setting. You know, I was teaching international relations at Georgetown, East Asian security. You know, I get this chance to operate in the policy world. And being the eager egg egghead academic, I said, I'm going to try out some of these theories. Right? So during one of the breaks of one of the six party sessions, I go up to the, our Chinese interlocutors and I say, um, have you ever thought about trying to press North Korea harder on economic reform. Um, after all, they could probably do something along the lines of what you have done or what the Vietnamese have done. And it would have sound a lot better coming from you because they're not going to listen to the Americans if they say it. They're not going to listen to the South Koreans if they say it. And they, they won't even talk to the Japanese. Right? So maybe if, the, you know, if you sort of did this, it might help to create some sort of uh, momentum in the talks. And my Chinese interlocutor looks at me, listens to what I say, say, and then the look of attention turns into disbelief. And he gives, this, he gives me this look that is basically the, what are you, stupid look? You know? so, and essentially, he was saying, what are you, stupid? You don't think we've tried that? You don't think that's the only message that we've been giving North Korea for the past 25 years? You think you're the first person that thought of this idea? So, um, so yes, China has had a long-term strategy for North Korea, which has been to try to promote top-down economic reform. And so what this, um, what this, this is a chart from my book that basically lists all the places that the Chinese took Kim Jong-il from 2000 to 2011. Uh, when he visited China. And so you can see, uh, let's see, you can see by the list of the places, all the places that they've, they've took him. They took him to cell phone factories, they took him to car, car plants, they took him to fiber optics plants, all these sorts of places. And so if you look at all the places that the Chinese took, it's very clear what the objective is, right? It's to try to promote top down economic reform in the country. So how successful have, has China been? Not very successful. Right? They've actually failed quite miserably in this objective. Indeed, the one constant in North Korean behavior has been the spectacular consistency with which the regime has disappointed in terms of enacting economic reform. Now, I said a few minutes ago that um, I chose these three particular explanations because there was an irony in each of them for Chinese objectives with regard to North Korea. And so the irony here is that not only has China failed miserably in this objective in trying to push the Chinese model, but they have also failed to acknowledge the conditions or the lessons that facilitated their own reform. Right? Um, and here in particular, for China, you know, uh, Deng's decision to modernize was made under, I would argue, much harsher conditions than those faced by North Korea today. Right? In China's case, and there are many here in the audience who know a lot more of this than I, in China's case, the decision was either, it was really to either reform or to die. That was the choice. Right? There was no backstop, right? There was no safety net for China. So the irony here is that if China truly wanted to see North Korea pursue Chinese-style economic reform, it should, it should not continue a lifeline to the country, but should completely cut them off. Right? Because that is the only way you force a regime to change. You force a regime to make the strategic choice, either reform or die. Uh, the second theory for why China um, does not abandon North Korea, it has to do with bureaucratic biases and standard foreign policy practices. Um, again, as well known to many of you, unlike other aspects of Chinese foreign poly policy, 
policy towards North Korea sits in the party rather than in the foreign ministry. Um, and there is a constant debate among China scholars um, here and around the world about how much, about one, how much this is changing, whether the relative balance on policy towards North Korea sits in the party or sits in the foreign ministry. And then second, whether the change, if it is shifting from party to foreign ministry, translates into a change in policy. Um, I think this is a very important discussion. It's what a lot of scholars who look at China and North Korea focus on. But to me, it just helps to explain changes in the shades of policy. That is, shades of gray versus black and white. Right? Um, fundamentally, the output of China's decision-making process on North Korea, whether it's in the party or in the foreign ministry, has been the same over two decades. And that is basically to maintain a policy of equidistance, equidistance between uh, the two Koreas. So after normalization of relations with South Korea in 1992, China has felt um, the mainstay of its policy towards the peninsula has been to try to maintain this balance between the two Koreas as the best way to maintain stability uh, on the peninsula. We actually looked at this at CSIS. Um, one of my hats is at CSIS as a senior advisor. We looked at this empirically and in fact found that China has tried very much to balance the two in terms of high level visits. Uh, these sorts of things has worked very hard to balance between the two. There are some exceptions to this. Um, uh, uh, right after 1992 normalization with the South, the North Koreans were very upset with the Chinese, so there were no visits for a while. And then the other exception is today, which we can certainly, uh, certainly talk about. Um, but again, to answer the initial question, the reason China doesn't abandon North Korea is because of the belief that this equidistance policy is the most conducive to stability. The irony here um, for China is that strict adherence to this strategy over the past decade has created what you could call a mutual hostage, a mutual hostage situation for China that is clearly not in its interests. And let me explain what I mean by this. Um, so again, going back to, um, you know, the older you get, the more you use anecdotes as evidence, right? Uh, the, uh, um, we were at, uh, when we used to go to six party talks, you know, you had negotiations, but there were always these ceremonial dinners that were done in, and it was often, you know, six-party talks was where you saw the Chinese and the North Koreans interact the most, because otherwise we really don't have a window into, into their sort of interaction. And the thing that struck me at um, uh, all these meetings was the two would go out of their way to show how special their relationship was. And the North Koreans in particular were very solicitous of, of the Chinese. So if we were about to go into a... Uh, a meeting with um, um, uh, uh, the six party delegations were about to go into a meeting with um, uh, um, a um, state councilor like uh, Dai Ming Guo or someone like that. Uh, we'd all be waiting outside for the doors to open and the North Korean negotiators would be sort of nudging their way to the front of the line so that once the door sprung open, they'd be the first one into the room you know, smiling and shaking hands and making sure all the pictures were, were with of, of the North Koreans standing right next to the Chinese, right? You know, arm in arm, hip to hip, this sort of thing. Um, really to sort of, you know, frame the narrative, at least to the public, is sort of the lips and teeth, right? The lips and teeth relationship. Um, but in reality, you know, the relationship is not lips and teeth. Right. The, um, the reality is that there really is no, especially these days, no love lost between uh, the two parties. You know, China does not love North Korea. It actually despises North Korea. Um, it despises the way the regime embarrasses China. It despises the way North Korea is a black hole for Chinese assistance. Um, but moving away from the equidistance policy creates or raises a specter of instability, right, which the Beijing does not want to see. So does China love North Korea? Absolutely not. But it's the only North Korea that they got, so they're stuck with it. Right? Uh, conversely, or similarly, the North Koreans do not have, despite all the efforts to take pictures together, do not have a deep love for the Chinese. 
They despise the Chinese. They despise the way the Chinese denigrate them. Uh, they despise the way uh, the Chinese treat North Korea like a poor province. Um, and the North Koreans are constantly paranoid that the US and China are colluding in some way right? at, and, um, at the six party talk. So does North Korea love China? Absolutely not. But it's the only China that they got. Right? And so they're stuck with them. So the irony here of China's equidistance policy is that it has put China in a mutual hostage situation. Right? Neither of them wants the other, but they're stuck with each other. They have, they have no other choice. Um, the third and final explanation for why China doesn't abandon North Korea has to do with history. Um, and um, I do want to uh, leave some time for discussion, so I'm not going to, let me be brief here. Um, here I'm not talking about um, uh, history in the sense of communist ideolo ideological history, but really the broader expanse of Chinese military history. And I feel most comfortable here making this point by citing um, um, Stapleton Roy, the former ambassador, China scholar, now at the Kissinger Institute. Um, Stape says that the most important lesson that the Chinese military learned from his the history of Korea is that when Korea is unstable, this never redounds to China's interests. Whether one is talking about the Pacific War, um, the Korean War, or going even further back, an unstable Korea is bad for China. Right? This is why China, a country that has border disputes with almost every country around its perimeter, went out of its way to negotiate a settlement to its borders with North Korea, right? and actually conceded territory in that settlement. Stability on this flank is absolutely paramount for the Chinese military. Uh, this neighboring Korean territory can never fall into an adversary's hands. Right? The irony here is obvious. Right? As long or the longer that China holds to this sort of geo strategy, the more it continues to give license to North Korean deviant behavior the less likely there will be a chance for reform in the North, and the more the reactions among the regional powers in terms of augmented defenses aggregate into a security situation that is detrimental to China's interests. So China faces a reform, you know, it faces a reform dilemma, faces a mutual hostage dilemma, and it faces a geostrategic dilemma with regard to North Korea. What is evident, I think, from all of these dilemmas is that, is that China is not interested in collapsing the North Korean regime much as we would like to believe that to be the case based on statements or editorials or things that we've seen written recently uh, by uh, Chinese scholars showing disfavor with the Kim Jong-un regime. Um, they're not interested in collapsing the regime. But what has been distilled from all this in terms of policy? And here, let me just make um, three quick points. I think in policy, we can think of it in terms of the short term, the medium term, and the long term. Um, and let me begin with the long term. Um, the long term policy, I think, remains the same, uh, which is the eternal hope for reform, some sort of major reform in North Korea. Not political reform, but economic reform. I still think that remains the long term <coughs> objective and goal. Um, again, not very successful. In the short term, the policy, I think, has really defaulted to tactics. Right? And the tactics are largely composed of two things. Um, one is trying to incentivize the North Koreans from not doing things that can create instability, like provocations, missile tests, nuclear tests, uh, and or incentivizing them to come back to the negotiating table, again, for the purpose of maintaining some sort of stability. Just like the long-term objective, the short-term tactic has not been terribly successful, although um, uh, we can certainly talk about the present period in which a conditional argument could be made uh, that they've been somewhat or uh, somewhat successful. So what this has resulted in is, in is a medium-term strategy over the last, I don't know, seven years or so. Um, in which China has invested a great deal in extractive industries in North Korea. 
in terms of coal and other minerals, right? The northern part of the peninsula is relatively well endowed in mineral resources compared to the south, which was the breadbasket of the country. Um, and I think it was set about seven or eight years ago, maybe a little bit earlier, uh, there's been um, a number of deals that have been struck between the Chinese and the North Koreans with regard to extracting minerals from the northern part of the peninsula. I think, and largely for domestic economic purposes in China, right? The two inland provinces, Jilin, Jilin and Liaoning province, um, benefit from these sorts of uh, activities. Um, if, if this has the effect of promoting reform in North Korea, that's great, but I think unlike the long-term strategy, this medium-term strategy is, de is designed largely to benefit China uh, economically. Um, the other reality today is that under Xi Jinping, um, relations with North Korea have changed quite a bit. Um, as we're all aware, Chinese scholars and officials now have license to express their dissatisfaction with the direction of the regime under Kim Jong-un. Um, and for what it's worth, the South Koreans under Park Geun-hye have noticed this and have been working very hard to try to squeeze into that space that they see or that they believe they see opening up between China and North Korea. Right? Under Park geun we've seen, was it five or six meetings between uh, Xi Jinping and the South Korean president and no meetings between Xi and the North Korean leader. Um, when uh, Park geun and Xi meet, there's clearly a chemistry there. They, they seem to like each other. Um, um, uh, there seems to be a personal rapport there. Park geun speaks some Chinese. So they seem to have a very good relationship. And the two have really tried to deepen across the board the South Korea-China relationship, whether it's um, strategic dialogues, whether it's uh, defense ministry dialogues, whether it's free trade agreements. There's really been an effort to develop right, this, uh, this relationship. So clearly, the South Koreans are trying to move the needle with China uh, on North Korea. Um, but um, I think while these sorts of things reflect a change in attitude by China with regard to North Korea, I don't think they reflect a change in strategy. Um, and this is a shame because in the end, uh, I think China's strategy must change because I don't think uh, the North Korean regime is sustainable in its current format. Um, we can certainly talk about this more in the discussion period, but the dynamic I see in North Korea today under Kim Jong-un is a situation where the politics of the country is becoming more and more rigid, right? Under Kim Jong-un, a couple of years ago, there was hope that this guy was somehow a reformer because he went to school in Switzerland and he, you know, he liked, what was it? He had a poster of Tony Kukoc in his <laughs> dorm room or something, you know, that, that this guy, and th I think there was really hope, hope that he might be a reformer. Uh, but what we've seen thus far is actually the politics of the regime becoming more and more rigid. Um, but at the same time, North Korean society is changing as well. Now, whenever we say change in North Korea, we have to use a much, more, a much smaller metric than we might use anywhere else. But there are definitely changes taking place in North Korean society, largely the result of what is now two decades of market mechanisms in North Korea, right? The market in North Korea, the black market, grew out of the famine in the mid-1990s when the public distribution system broke down and people had to fend for themselves uh, to, to, to live, right? They, had to, they couldn't count on handouts from the government, so they had to go and fend for themselves in the markets. And so that's been going on now for 20 years. Um, and so there's a civil society that's developing around the market now. There's more information technology in the country. There's, more, there's a greater demand for information about the outside world. All these sorts of things are happening, albeit slowly, in North Korea. And so the broader dynamic is not a good one, right? The politics are becoming more rigid. Society is becoming more and more open, even though it's slowly. This is a combination that can't hold forever, right? Um, it, it, just, it just can't. We don't know what the trigger is going to be. Um, we never do, right? We never knew what the trigger was 
collapse of the Soviet Union. We never knew what the trigger was with the Arab Spring until after it happened. So we never know what the trigger is. But as many of my friends who were Soviet experts and many of my friends who were Middle East experts, after the fall of the wall and after the Arab Spring, they all came out and said, oh yes, it was obvious. Right? All the indicators were there. Right? Um, and you know, I think all the indicators were there with DPRK. Uh, and that the, the macro trend is not a good one. Um, so we don't know what the trigger will be, but sooner or later it will, be happen it will happen. And we're all going to be terribly unprepared um, um, uh, for it unless strategically we start thinking about um, things that could be coming down the road. Foremost there, of course, and this is my last point, is in terms of cooperation between the United States, South Korea, and China. Right? This is something that people have been calling for for a long time. Um, uh, uh, some sort of strategic discussion among the three countries about the future of the Korean Peninsula. Everyone knows it's a difficult discussion to have. Um, the US and ROK have discussions. I think the ROK is trying to have discussions with China. I think the US is trying to have discussions with China. Um, everybody's afraid of um, revealing too much in these sorts of discussions. But it's clearly something that's, that's necessary uh, if you accept the fact that uh, the regime, as it moves in its current direction, is not a good one. And then as, as things stand right now, nobody seems to be really prepared uh, if something were to happen. Uh, in North Korea. Um, you know, the problem every time you give a talk on North Korea is you can never end it on a positive note. <laughs> um, so I'm afraid I'm just going to have to end it here. And I'm <laughs> uh, happy to take any questions you have. Thanks for your, thanks for your attention. Uh, yes. Could you say something about the fact that um, if North Korea were to disappear and in the two Koreas be reunited, that uh, then China would have a questionable um, party on its border that might lean more towards the West than towards it? Yeah, I think that's certainly one of China's big concerns is that, as I said, you know, historically, uh, when there has been uncertainty on that border, it's never gone well from them. Um, so the question is, how do, you, how do you remedy something like that? I mean, the, personally, I don't think the United States is going to position troops on a United Korean Peninsula aimed at a ground invasion of China. Yeah. Right? And uh, even if the United States wanted to do that, I don't think Congress would allow them. <laughs> so it really becomes a question of how can you shape perceptions on all sides to see a united Korea that is a liberal, a market democracy that is still aligned with the United States is not being threatening to China's interests, right? And I think that's certainly what the South Koreans are trying to do, I think, with all this effort at you know, creating these strategic dialogues, signing a free trade agreement um, with China. They're, they're trying to show that two things. One, that China's equities on the Korean Peninsula are with the South, they're not with the North. And two, that um, a future Korea is not necessarily going to be anathema to Chinese interests. But, um, but you know, understandably, that's a very difficult process, right? I mean, historically, whenever you have two countries of different regime types that share a land border, there are going to be security dilemmas on that border. It's inevitable. So I don't think a United Korea-China border is going to look like the United States and Canada. Right. Um, um, uh, but still, that doesn't mean it has to necessarily be an adversarial relationship. No. The arrest and summary execution of Vice Chairman Zhang was probably the most spectacular internal development politically within North Korea. But there are also rumors now that is related also to this to the charge against Zhou Yongkang within China in terms of the uh, uh, in terms of his release of the information that led to the arrest of and execution of Mr. Zhan and how that may play into the uh, China-North Korean relations. Um, <clears throat> well, I think um, the, uh, yes, the execute, so Chang Sung-tek was the 
uh, uncle of Kim Jong-un. Uh, everybody saw him as the mentor or uh, the, the, the sort of, well, the key person between, from the death of Kim Jong-il, the father, to, to the son. And, um, and he was executed. And if anybody, I don't know if you've met anybody that says they, they were not surprised by this execution. If you've met someone that says they were not surprised by the execution, they're lying to you. <laughs> because everybody was surprised by this, by this execution. Uh, on the question of this, the release of information, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. Um, and I do agree with you that it was a major political development inside of North Korea, but it was not the only one. Um, the, uh, the number of executions, purges, disappearances, rotations of people in this regime under this young leader, I think is really unprecedented in terms of the speed and the concentration of it. Um, you know, this famous picture of Kim Jong-un with the hearse of his father, with the, surrounded by generals, right? I mean, all of those generals are now gone, right? Um, <clears throat> the top, Lee Young-ho, the top military general that everybody thought was working with Chang Song tech to help usher this guy in. He's gone. Everybody go everybody's gone. We looked at, um, not at the top levels, but we looked at sort of the higher management levels within the KPA, the Korean People's Army, and looked at sort of the, the, um, the, the movement of people there. Also very fluid, right? moving very quickly. So I think Chang's execution to me <coughs> was not a sign that the, the transition process had been completed. To me, it was much more a manifestation of the extents to which they were willing to go to try to consolidate power, which to me means that there's something wrong, and there's still something wrong uh, inside the system. We, just, we still don't know why he disappeared for as long as he did last year. Right? I mean, supposedly it was his foot, his ankle, but we just don't know. Um, and then for him to disappear and for the three top guys in North Korea, while he's missing to then suddenly go to South Korea for the Asian Games to meet with South Korean high-level officials. Just, it doesn't make any sense. Right? So um, I don't know the specific answer to the question about release of information, but um, Chang's execution to me is, is a, it continues to be a sign that things are quite fluid inside. Would you please unpack the comment you made about uh, that space that China is kind of divergent, the license that they feel to, uh, to kind of criticize? Is it based on age? Is there some disdain for Kim Jong-un's age vis-a-vis -vis the, the Chinese leadership? Um, <clears throat> I mean, it could be. Um, I, I think more broadly, it is a concern about the overall direction of the regime the things that this young North Korean leader appears to be prioritizing inside the country. Right? I mean, not really prioritizing serious economic reform, but prioritizing ski resorts and amusement parks and uh, you know, things of that nature. So um, Dennis Rodman, you know, hosting Dennis Rodman. Not what you would consider to be um, the sorts of priorities that even a young leader should be concerned with. And I, you know, and I think these sorts of things are quite troublesome to, to the Chinese leadership. Um, <clears throat> there's, always been a, there's always been a question as to how much direct influence uh, China has on North Korean behavior. Um, that was the case during Kim Jong-il, uh, probably more so the case under Kim Jong-un. And you know, I think for these reasons, the, you know, the Chinese are willing to show much more open um, uh, concern, disdain, at least among uh, scholars about, uh, about how they're concerned about the leadership. Now, I don't think that means they directly will criticize Kim Jong-un by name. And I certainly don't think, as I said, it's a change in strategy. I mean, I think it's an attitude. But I'm, at least I don't see yet the manifestations of a clear strategic shift in policy.
Thank you. I'll continue on, on the note of uh, North Korean leadership. Um, is, from your understanding, um, is the North Korean government rational? Or in other words, should US policy be conducted under the assumption that the North Korean government um, have strate certain strategic thinking, but just operate under a different system and ideology? Or are they just deeply incompetent and erratic, and thus unpredictable? Um, I think they're rational. Um, they've been rationally deterred from another conventional invasion. Right? Um, it appears, knock on wood, that since 2010, they've been rationally deterred from another conventional provocation that, will, that is uh, lethal, that kills South Korean soldiers or citizens, because um, there's an understanding that the South Koreans will respond kinetically to the next provocation. So at least it appears since 2010, that's five years ago, that they've been deterred from those sorts of things. So I think you, know, I think you can argue that uh, elements of the behavior do appear to be rationally, appear to be rational, in this case, rationally deterred. Having said that, you can still be rational but have a higher propensity for risk taking. And I think the DPRK is like that. They are rational, but they have a much higher propensity for risk taking, you know, and I and I wrote about this many years ago, in an international security article that basically, you know, it's classic coercive bargaining. You know, if you're more willing to take risk, you're more willing to shake up the status quo, and then try to negotiate something by returning uh, from the crisis to the peaceful status quo. That's classic North Korean coercive bargaining, uh, and it entails a higher degree of risk that they're willing to take. Right? And that others are willing to walk them down from. So, and and at the same time, they can be a little bit incompetent too. I think that's all. I think that's also possible. I certainly think that part of what incentivizes China to deepen its relationship with South Korea is the broader regional picture. Right? I mean, very clearly, um, you know, China would like to see uh, less tightness in uh, uh, the US relationship with its allies in the region. Right? And so I think every time that the Chinese, and of course I'm paraphrasing here, but every time the Chinese come out of a meeting with the South Korean leadership, they probably come out of that meeting saying, our strategy is working. Right? <laughs> We're pulling the South Koreans closer. But I bet you the South Koreans walk out of that same meeting, and they walk out of that meeting and go, our strategy is working. We're pulling the Chinese away from the North Koreans. Right? And so they probably both feel like they're doing well at this game. Um, and you know, who's right? I, I just don't know. I mean, I think from the South Korean perspective, um, the interest in China, I don't think it has to do with Japan. I mean, obviously, Japan Korea relations are quite bad right now. Uh, but I don't think the outreach to China is derivative of the fact that the relationship with Japan is so bad. I think it's entirely about North Korea. It's entirely about North Korea. And you can see um, uh, in elements every time the Chinese and the South Koreans interact, you know, they're, in the regional perspective, there are these efforts by the Chinese to sort of play the history card, you know, to try to raise these issues, pull the South Koreans over. And the South Koreans, to their credit, have not bit at that yet. right? Um, uh, they would not, um, at the SICA meetings, right, they would not accept this definition of security that um, uh, was quite, uh, that suggested that the US alliance framework was no longer a good way to think about security. Or in the bilateral meetings with the Chinese, um, the South Koreans very clearly, every time the history issue came up, uh, had a very clear, um, talking point, um, which was that uh, you have your history issues, China, you have your history issues with Japan, we have our history issues with Japan, but these are bilateral issues, right? And we're not gonna fall into some sort of regional, regional game here. So thus far, I think they've held to that pretty well, but you know, who knows with regard to the, to the future. Thanks a lot for coming. Uh, I would like to ask two questions. One is whether uh, Russia is still involved in this process, and to what extent uh, it changed or continued its line, given the, all of the recent events. And the second one is you 
most of the time think of China or speak of China as a united actor towards North Korea. But at some point you said that there may be some differences between sort of the party and Ministry of Foreign Affairs as in different actors <coughs> that, that deal with foreign policy. If you could speak a little bit more whether there are factions within the Chinese policy establishment that would favor the so-called like alternative strategy towards North Korea, or there is a broad consensus towards that. Thank okay. you. Um, well, these guys can probably answer the second question better than I can. Well, on the first, let me try the first. On the first, on Russia. So there is, for those of you who have been following, there's been sort of this renaissance in China. I mean, in Russia, DPRK relations, right? I mean, Putin forgave all the debt. Um, that North Korea owes to, to China. He's invited uh, Kim Jong-un May to come to, his, to, to Moscow. Um, there have been, uh, I think the foreign minister actually just left or is en route for a week in Russia for meetings. So there's a real effort um, on both sides to develop this relationship. Um, what's the significance of it? Um, there's clearly a, the, the long-term strategy or goal has been has been clear, right? Which is to be able to move Russian resources through the northern part of Korea uh, and to access uh, warm water ports in the northern part of Korea uh, for commerce with the rest of Asia, right? That has sort of been the grand dream that's been out there for a long time, and virtually everything that Russia does with the Korean Peninsula has some element of that broader approach in mind. Um, how significant the current iteration of activity is, I'm not so certain. Um, you know, I look at, I tend to look at this like a social scientist, and so you look at um, periods in which Russia DPRK relations have been active, and they always tend to be periods where the North Koreans are in bad shape with everybody else. So when there's nothing going on with the Americans and with the South Koreans and with the Japanese and with the Chinese, that's when you start seeing movement in uh, Russia, DPRK relations. And, um, and it continues up until the point where something happens in one of the other channels. My US DPRK talks start. Or north-south talks start. And then when those things happen, then the Russia piece kind of fades away. Um, um, at least that's what we've seen in the past. So, um, so that's what I expect to see in the future. I wouldn't, I'm not going to bet the house that Kim Jong-un is going to go uh, in May to Moscow. There's just a, that's, that's just a long way from now. Um, so I certainly wouldn't bet on that just yet. Um, I actually think we have a better chance of getting back to diplomacy with North Korea in the six-party process than Kim Jong-un going to Russia in, in May. So that's how much, that's how, that's how much I'm uh, um, uh, bending against that. In terms of views within China, you know, it's, it's, it's anybody's guess. I mean, I think there's a lot of talk these days about the extent to which the relationship between China and North Korea has moved from a special relationship to just a relationship, which is supposedly signals um, that the locus of decision making on policy has gravitated from the party um, to the liaison committee of the party to the foreign ministry. Um, it's very clear when you talk to foreign ministry officials who are educated, global, cosmopolitan people that are trying to advance China's foreign policy objectives abroad, you know, they. <laughs> I mean, North Korea is just like such a pain for them, right? It's not something that they're at all happy about. So, um, um, so at least right now, it looks as though there is quite a bit of disdain in the Chinese foreign policy establishment for North Korea. Uh, but again, like I said, I don't think that that means that we can then take messages from that that North Korea is ready to jump on the bandwagon with everybody else and and you know and throw this regime into the dustbin of history and move forward into a, into a new Asia. I, uh, you know, it's, in that sense, China's like the United States. It's like a big aircraft carrier. And to just move it an inch takes a long time. So, three questions. OK.
the triple threat questions. Well, okay. I don't think it'll be a threat. But anyway, the first thing is I'm not quite sure about your mutual hostage theory. So certainly China is end up supporting North Korea and they don't want to pay China doesn't want to pay North Korea as much as they are doing now. So I can see that why China North Korea could be China's hostage. So they are it's kind of cost, it's a burden. And but from North Korean perspective, I think they are getting more from China than what they pay them in return. So I wonder how it can be how North Korea can be China's hostage is the first question. And second question is uh, is just I will, I'd like to know how you're thinking on current Obama administration's North Korean policy, which is called strategic patience. To me, it seems like just sit back and do nothing until it collapses. It might collapse, it may not, until who knows when. And third is Obama was recently normalized diplomatic relationship with Cuba, saying that if you have tried the same policy for decades and decades, and if it didn't work, then it's time to work, try something new. And I wonder why the same administration cannot try the same logic, apply the same logic to a different regime. Okay, so I think your second and third questions actually answer each other. Uh, but let me do, I'll let me, the first question, on the first question, um, oh, uh, mutual hostages. So I think on the North Korean side, uh, I think the, the main reason has to do with um, uh, the fact that, I mean, if you go to Pyongyang today, it looks like it's doing well. There's a lot of hard currency flowing in North Korea today. And it's all from these deals that the Chinese have done since, what, 2008, 2009, um, uh, in mining and other things in the northern part of the peninsula. Now, so that looks great, right? It looks like the North Koreans are getting more than they're giving uh, to China. At the same time, though, I think we can't um, underestimate uh, the level of anger uh, that exists in North Korea about these deals. Um, they have no say over the terms of these deals. Um, you know, there are, I mean, not that North Korea is a human rights bastion, because it's not, but they're, they're, they have no say over the labor regulations. Who knows what is going on inside? And these terms are all being dictated by the Chinese. I mean, you know, they, treat China, North Korea like a poor province. So in that sense, the North Koreans are happy to have this because there's no other source of hard currency today. But at the same time, they're hostage to it. They have really have no other choice. Uh, uh, they could try to ask for different terms, or they could, uh, but they're not going to get them. And, um, and so they're betting, they, you know, the, the city of Pyongyang is benefiting from all this hard currency, but um, I don't think they're very happy with it at all. On your second and third questions, um, I don't know who did the press. I don't know who came up with the term strategic patience. Um, I don't know if it was the press or somebody said it. Um, and I think, in one sense, it is. It has become sort of a uh, a moniker for a strategy that. You know, basically everybody acknowledges that there's really no good options with North Korea. So if you're really not sure what to do, it's better not to do anything and just wait. Um, but at the same time, your third question is really the answer. I mean, I, I think, you know, this is personal opinion, um, that if the administration had its chance, it would try to do with North Korea what it has, try, what it has been trying to do with Myanmar, Iran, and Cuba. Right? I mean, if you do not see a linear relationship between these three countries and what President Obama said in his campaign you know, years and years ago, I mean, you're missing the picture. I mean, this is clearly what they want to do. They see their diplomacy as transformational. And they would like that opportunity with, I mean, I think they would like that opportunity with North Korea. The problem is North Korea has not even not given them a foothold. They have not given them anything to give them an opportunity to push forward with negotiations. I mean, it's, it looks like it's strategic patience, but if you look carefully, right after this administration came into office, they had a senior envoy, Steve Bosworth, right? The first thing he did as senior envoy after he got his, you know, you're the senior envoy, was they sent him to North Korea, 
right? And they and and he was he was sitting in a hotel room waiting for a meeting with uh, the North Korean leadership. So, and the February deal, another example. There have been a number of attempts by this administration that have tried, and the North Koreans have basically been unresponsive. That's why you haven't seen any movement. So my own, my personal view is that if if the North Koreans just gave him a foothold, I mean not even a foothold, just a toehold. <laughs> then you know these guys would jump in, um, and uh, you know because they would jump in and try some sort of negotiation. Um, so um, you know I think it's often the case we tend to think the absence of diplomacy between the United States and North Korea has to do with the United States. We're not trying hard enough. You know we're not pushing hard enough, and. You know, at, at certain points in history, that might be true, but it all also presumes an awful lot about the United States. It, it, it presumes that if we just sit down with any country that we that we're, we refuse to sit down with before, if we just sit down with them, we'll get a deal, right? And as we all know, those of us who sat down with them, it's not that easy. <laughs> um, and in fact, uh, it's 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 quite it's quite difficult because they don't want to give up their nuclear weapons, right? And if that's what the negotiation's about, then you've got to ask yourself why you're sitting at the table. Um, you mentioned that civil society is developing around the market and that there's, some, there's greater demand for information from the outside world. Can you elaborate on that? You know, uh, thanks for noticing that, because I kind of threw that out there, because I wanted to see if anybody picked it up. It's actually an area. So the answer is we don't know a whole lot about it. So there have been some, Intermedia has done a report on this, right? Um, and there are a couple of other reports that have come out. The Bush Institute actually did a report on this as well. Um, but it's something a lot of scholars are looking at now because, you know, before this, there was no literature on civil society in North Korea. I mean, it was kind of like these two things were not, they were oxymorons, right? Civil society in North Korea. But um, anywhere you have a market, you're going to have a civil society. And so scholars like Andrew Yeo at Catholic University, a couple of other scholars are really trying to look into this now, trying to see if they, they can discern what sort of civil society there is now. You know, and it's in combination with technology. So um, there are about 2.5 million cell phones now in North Korea. Right? Population is 22 million, so it's not that many. but. For North Korea, two and a half million cell phones is still a lot. They can SMS each other, so people are SMS. You know, they're, they're com before this, there was no way to communicate. No one has a phone in their house right, in North Korea, so now they're able to communicate with each other. They text each other the price of rice in different markets. So there's things that have been enabled by the markets and technology in civil society that, that didn't exist before, and so it's a, you know for any of you doctoral candidates out there. It's a very, I think it's a very interesting area for research. But there's, there's no evidence so far of any kind of organization? Not, not, organi not, not, not formally organized, yeah. no. But informally, mm -hmm. there's lots of evidence of things that are going, uh, things that are going on. I mean, it's, and it's just, it's really fascinating stuff. Like um, this intermediate report said one of the things that we see now is that the demand or hunger for information about the outside world um, is so has grown so much in North Korea that um, um, it has become so it has become a form of social capital. So um, uh, people people organize around they you know somebody in the village has some new information about something happening in China, for example. And then everybody starts to organize around that, and they want to hear it. I mean, people who have information about the outside world have social status, right? Um, there are all these sorts of little things that we're starting to see that we've never seen before. Um, and I think, and we're starting to see it now because it's been growing for 20 years through the markets, but now with technology, it's there's really we've, we're able to see a lot more now. So. Just to follow up on that, um, I've heard that the administration or that the government actually relies on the black market as well as other parts of civil society. Do you know anything about that? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the government used to try to tightly control. I mean, first, when they had the famine in the mid-1990s, uh, you know, they basically let, let everyone be as they were. So they could, you know, the markets were operating. 
Then when the famine ended and they had enough rice that they tried to clamp down on the markets. And the two times that we've had anecdotal evidence of you know, significant social resistance has been when the government has tried to crack down on the markets, re-denominate the currency, these sorts of things. Um, now there's much more of a uh, almost laissez-faire approach to the markets because they see them as helping to stabilize prices uh, when, you know, when there's shortages and things. So there's a, there's a different relationship there. And, and this is why I think this is a slippery slope because now the government has become dependent on the markets in some format. And the government has become dependent on cell phone technology. Not in the sense that they have to use it, but the understanding is, uh, based on the um, um, uh, Sheena, Sheena Chestnut, Sheena Greitens, at, um, formerly at Harvard, uh, did, a, did a study on this. So apparently, the cell phone market started in North Korea through the Egyptian company Orascom. North Korea had this big hotel that they never finished, right? This big, the Ryugyung Hotel that they never finished. And um, the deal with Orascom was that they would resurface the front of the building um, in return for having the exclusive cell phone contract in North Korea. The North Korean government, I think, um, and Sheena has the actual number, but I, for some reason, I think it's like $63 million. They shave basically $63 million off of cell phone subscriptions in North Korea. And, and so that revenue is only going to increase the more subscriptions they allow, which gives them more hard currency, which they need. So, um, so they're kind of locked into these things. And you know, eventually, this is a slippery slope. right? So. Yes. Hi, um, thank you. I'd like to hear what you thought of uh, the interview and uh, how. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I need to sound noted at the door. And uh, how, how that changed how North Korea sees itself and how other people view its interactions with the outside world. Do you think that's impacted its behavior? Um, <clears throat> so I have seen it, the interview. How many of you have seen the interview? Yeah, there you go. See? It's, it was entertaining. Um, the. Um, you know, I think this has really bothered them. Right? <laughs> no, but I mean, seriously, but it's interesting because why didn't the other ones bother them? Like Team America, right, came out, uh, White House Down. I mean, there are a number of these movies that have come out that have made North Korea either made them the villain or ridiculed them. And you didn't have the reaction like you did to the interview. So the question is why? You know, why this time? You know, one answer is sure. It's the plot is to assassinate the North Korean leader. So no one likes movies in which their leader is going to be assassinated, right? So I think that's part of it. But I don't think that's the real reason. You know, I think the real reason has to do with the fact that this movie came out right at the same time that all this stuff was happening on human rights with regard to North Korea, right? The UN Commission of Inquiry report, uh, basically last week a year ago. Right, started this groundswell of international interest in the North Korean human rights issue. The UN General Assembly last December passed a resolution, 111 countries uh, calling for referral of the North Korean leadership to the International Criminal Court. Right? Um, uh, it's now on the UN Security Council agenda as a discussion item. So the UN Security Council, not that it will anytime soon, but it could, in theory, try to push for a resolution referring um, the North Korean leadership to the International Criminal Court. I mean, this is stuff they've never seen before, right? They've seen sanctions, right? Next week, right? Next week, they start military exercises. They've seen all this stuff before, right? The two things they've never seen before were BDA, right, in 2005, 2006, right? The, the financial sanctions against the, the bank in Macau. And then this, this human rights stuff. And they reacted to both of these things the same way, which is a um, great deal of uncertainty, a lot of anger, but at the same time, trying diplomacy. They're basically all over the playing field, right? Because they don't know how to respond to these things. And I think this human rights stuff has really bothered them. We held a conference at CSIS last week, a private, non-governmental organization conference to, to, on the one-year anniversary of the Commission of Inquiry report, right? this report that the UN did. 
So we had all the UN commissioners come, and then um, uh, Bob King, the Obama envoy, and Lee Jong-un. And you know, it was just a private conference in Washington, D.C. on a snow day, right? It, this was the day the U.S. government was closed. All the schools were closed. CSIS was even closed. But we held the conference anyway because everybody flew in for it. Um, the North Koreans, the night before the conference in New York, issued a statement from the UN demanding that the conference be canceled. They demarched the State Department demanding that the conference be canceled. And then after the conference, KCNA, right, their, their news outlet, the Foreign Ministry put out a statement condemning, condemning the conference. You know how many conferences we've done on North Korean nuclear weapons? Not a peep, right? But this one, you know, I mean, to that level, they, uh, they were um, complaining, which means it really bothers them. And, and so I think the, the answer on the interview is I think the reason they reacted the way they did was it was coming at the same time that all this human rights stuff was. I mean, the counterfactual, I think, was if you didn't have the human rights stuff, they probably wouldn't have responded to this movie. But because the two things came together, and they were really frazzled by the human rights stuff that um, they reacted the way they did. So why don't you take one more? Okay. And maybe you can stick around and talk to people. Sure, questions. sure. Okay, one more question. Yes. And as the year, there have been like media speculations of, uh, oh, uh, concerning Kim Jong Un's health. Uh, and I'm curious whether or not they're valid, um, but also if he were to die without a royal baby. Uh, would the regime, oh, how would the regime change, and how might China react to that situation? So, so there is a royal baby, right? And we found out about it through Dennis Rodman, right? Because <laughs> Dennis Rodman, when he said, I held the baby, you know. Uh, so we knew she was pregnant, but we didn't know. But so we actually found out through Dennis Rodman that uh, there's, a, there's a baby. <coughs> the, the diplomat, Dennis Rodman. Um, um, I think there are legitimate concerns about his health. I mean, he's only 30-something years old, but he's, you know, he's, does, he's not a healthy person, right? <laughs> and um, I don't know if you've seen the recent pictures of him with his new haircut, but they, have, they compare side by side with pictures when he first started his job, and there's clearly a difference. Um, but if you talk to um, the EU ambassadors that have their missions in North Korea, um, uh, they come through, you know, they let him out every once in a while. They come through Washington and looking to talk to people. And, and they've met him, too. And, and, and you know, he, he doesn't look like a healthy person. So I think there are real concerns about that. There's clearly a history of heart disease in the family, right? His grandfather died of a heart, massive heart attack. His father died of a massive heart attack, right? We don't know whether his, where his aunt is, but apparently she has heart problems, too. There's, cl there's clearly this in, in, in the family. Um, and if he were to... If he were to disappear, it's, it's completely unclear what would come next. I mean, there is a sense of now who the, the, the next tier advisors are to him. But whether they could run the country, you know, nobody knows. I think the scenario, I mean, the, to me, the, the best scenario would be, you're not going to get democracy in North Korea, obviously. But the best scenario would be, to move from a personality cult leadership to a military dictatorship. Normally, we don't see that as a good thing. But in the North Korean case, it may be. Because military dictatorships have a much higher propensity of making rational economic decisions than personality cult leaderships, right? I mean, look at Burma. Look at South Korea, right? Look at Taiwan. I mean, they have a much better propensity of doing that. So. Um, um, so there is a happy note on which to end, right? <laughs> Hope for a dictatorship. So.